Nations by consent, decomposing the nation state. Libertarians tend to focus on two important units of analysis, the individual and the state. And yet, one of the most dramatic and significant events of our time has been the reemergence, with a bang, in the last five years of a third and much neglected aspect of the real world, the nation. When the nation has been thought of at all, it usually comes attached to the state, as in the common world, the nation state. But this concept takes a particular development of recent centuries and elaborates it into a universal maxim. In the last five years, however, we have seen as a corollary of the collapse of communism in the Soviet Union and in Eastern Europe, a vivid and startlingly swift decomposition of the centralized state or alleged nation state into its constituent nationalities. The genuine nation or nationality has made a dramatic reappearance on the world stage. Part 1. The Reemergence of the Nation The nation, of course, is not the same thing as the state, a difference that earlier libertarians and classical liberals such as Ludwig von Mises and Albert J. Nock understood full well. Contemporary libertarians often assume, mistakenly, that individuals are bound to each other only by the nexus of market exchange. They forget that everyone is necessarily born into a family, a language, and a culture. Every person is born into one or several overlapping communities, usually including an ethnic group with specific values, cultures, religious beliefs, and traditions. He is generally born into a country. He is always born into a specific historical context of time and place, meaning neighborhood and the land area. The modern European nation-state, the typical world power, began not as a nation at all, but as an imperial conquest of one nationality, usually at the center of, a, of the resulting country, and based in the capital city, over other nationalities at the periphery. Since a nation is a complex structure of subjective feelings of nationality based on objective realities, the imperial central states have had varying degrees of success in forging among their subjective nationalities at the periphery of a, of a sense of national unity incorporating submission to the imperial center. In Great Britain, the English have never truly eradicated national aspirations among the submerged Celtic nationalities, the Scots and the Welsh, although Cornish nationalism seems to have mostly been stampered out. In Spain, the conquering Castilians, based in Madrid, have never managed, as the world saw in the Barcelona Olympics, to erase nationalism among the Catalans, the Basques, or even the Galicians. The French, moving out of their base in Paris, have never totally tamed the Bretons, the Basques. It is now well known that the collapse of the centralizing and imperial Russian Soviet Union has lifted the lid on the dozens of previously suppressed nationalisms within the former USSR, and, is and it is now becoming clear that Russia itself, or rather the Russia Federated Republic, is simply a slighter older imperial formation in which the Russians, moving out from their Moscow center, forcibly incorporated many nationalities, including the Tatars, the Yukuts, and the Chechnyans, and many others. Much of the USSR stemmed from Imperial Russian conquests in the 19th century, during which the, clashings, the clashing Russians and British managed to carve up much of Central Asia. The nation cannot be precisely defined. It is a complex and varying constellation of different forms of communities, languages, ethnic groups, or religions. S some nationalities, such as the Slovenes, are both a separate ethnic group and a language, Others, such as the warring groups in Bosnia, are the same ethnic group whose language is the same, but who differ in the form of alphabet, and who fiercely and who class, clash fiercely on religion, the Eastern Orthodox Serbs, the Catholic Croats, and the Bosnian Muslims. The question of nationality is made more complex by the interplay of, ob ob of objectivity, existing reality, and the subjective perceptions. In some cases, such as Eastern European nationalities under the Habsburgs or the Irish under the British, nationalism, including submerged and sometimes dying languages, had to be consequently preserved, generated, and expanded. 
In the 19th century, this was done by a determined intellectual elite struggling to revive peripheries living under and partially absorbed by the imperial center. Part 2. The Fallacy of Collective Security The problem of the nation has been aggravated in the 20th century by the overriding influence of Wilsonianism on, U on the USA and worldwide foreign policy. I refer not to the idea of national self-determination, observed mainly in the breach after World War I, but to the concept of collect collective security against aggression. The fatal flaw in the secluded... And the seducive concept is that it treats nation states by an analogy with individual aggressors, with the world community in the guise of a cop on the corner. The cop, for example, sees A aggressing against or stealing the property of B. The cop not naturally rushes to defend B's property and his person or possessions. In the same way, wars between two nations or state are assumed to have the similar aspect. State A invades or aggresses against state B. State A is promptly designated the aggressor by the international policeman or by his presumptive surrogate, be it the League of Nations, the United Nations, the US President or Secretary of State, or the editorial writer of the August New York Times. Then, the world police force, whatever it may be, is supposed to swing promptly into action and stop the principle of aggression or to prevent the aggressor be it Saddam Hussein or the Serbian guerrillas in Bosnia from fulfilling the presumed goals of swimming across the Atlantic and murdering every resident of New York or Washington DC. A crucial flaw in this popular line of argument goes deeper than the usual discussion of whether or not American air power or troops can really eradicate the Iraqis or Serbs without too much difficulty. The crucial flaw is the implicit assumption of the entire analysis that every nation state owns its entire geographical area in the same and just and proper way that every individual property owner owns his person and the property that he has inherited work for, worked for or gained in voluntary exchange. Is it the boundary of the nation state, of the typical nation state, really as just or beyond? as beyond, cavil, as in your own, as your, or in my house, estate, or factory. It seems to me that not only the classical liberal or the libertarian, but anyone of a good sense who thinks about this problem may must respond a resounding no. It is absurd to designate every nation state with its self-proclaimed boundary as it exists at any one time as somehow right and sacrosanct each of its territorial integrity to remain as spotless and unbreached as your or my bodily person or private property. Inadvertently, of course, these boundaries have been acquired by force and violence or by interstate agreement above and beyond the heads of the inhabitants on the spot. Invariably, these boundaries shift a great deal over time in ways that make proclamations of, ter of territorial integrity tr truly ludicrous. Take for example the current mess in Bosnia. Only a couple of years ago establishment opinion received opinion of left, right, or center loudly proclaimed the importance of maintaining the territorial integrity of Yugoslavia and bitterly denounced all secession movements. Now a short time later the same establishment only recently defending the Serbs as the champions of the Yugoslav nation against vicious secessionist movement time to destroy that integrity now reveals and wishes to crush up the Serbs for aggression against the territorial integrity of Bosnia or Bosnia Herzegovina, a trumped up nation that has no more existence than the nation of Nebraska before 1991. But these pitfalls in which we are bound to fall if we remain trapped by the mythology of the nation state whose ch whose chance boundary at at time t must be upheld as property owning entity with its own sacred and invaluable rights in a deeply flawed analogy with the rights of private property to adopt an excellent strategy of ludwig von mises in abstracting from contemporary emotions let us postate two contagious nation states Ruthenia and Fredonia. Let us assume that Ruthenia has suddenly invaded Eastern Fredonia and claims it as his own. Must we 
automatically condemn Ritunia for its evil act of aggression against Fredonia and send troops either literally or metaphorically against the brutal Rithunians in behalf of the brave little Fredonia. By no means. For it is possible that, say two years ago, Eastern Fredonia had been part and parcel of Ruthonia, what was indeed Western Ruthonia, that either the Ruhr's ethnic and national demonizations of the land had been crying out for the past two years against Fredonian oppression, in short, the international disputes in particular, and the, in the immoral words of W. S. Gilbert. Things are sold on what they seem. Squim milk masquerades as cream. The beloved international cop, whether it be the Bush, Bustros, Gali, or U.S. troops, or the New York Times editorialist, had best think more than twice before leaping into this fray. Americans are especially unsuited for their self-proclaimed Winsonian role as, the, as world moralists and policemen. Nationalism in the U.S. is precariously recent and is more of an idea that is rooted in a long-standing ethnic or nationality groups or struggles. Add that into the deadly mix that Americans have virtually no historical memory, and this makes Americans particularly unsuited to barreling in to intervene in the Balkans, where who took what side at what place in the war against the Turkish invaders in the 15th century is far more intensely real to most of the contenders than it is yesterday's dinner. Libertarians and classical liberals, who are particularly well equipped to rethink the entire muddled area of the nation state and foreign affairs, have been too wrapped up in the Cold War against communism and the Soviet Union to engage in fundamental thinking on these issues. Now that the Soviet Union has collapsed and the Cold War is over, perhaps classical liberals will feel, will feel free to think anew about these critically important problems. Part 3. Rethinking Secession First, we can conclude that not all state boundaries are just. One goal for libertarians should be to transform existing nation-state into national entities whose boundaries should be called just in the same sense that private boundaries are just. That is, to decompose existing coercive nation-states into genuine nations, genuine nations, or nations by consent. In this case, for example, of the Eastern Fredonians, the inhabitants should be able to cede voluntarily from Fredonia and join their comrades in Ruthenia. Again, classical liberals should resist the impulse to say that national boundaries don't make any difference. It's true, of course, as classical liberals have long proclaimed that the less the degree of government intervention in either Fredonia or Ruthenia, the less difference such a boundary will make. But even under a minimal state, National boundaries would still make a difference, often a big one to the inhabitants of that of the area. For in what language, Ruthenian, Ferdonian, or both, will be the streets will be the street sign, telephone books, court proceedings, or school classes of that area. In short, every group, every nationality, should be allowed to secede from any nation state and join any other nation state that agrees to have it. This, that simple reform would go a long way into establishing nations by consent. The Scots, if they want to, should be allowed to, should be allowed by the English to leave the United Kingdom and to become independent and even form a Gallic Confederation if the constituents so desire. A common response to a word of proliferating nations is to worry about the multitude of trade barriers that might be erected. But other things being equal. The greater the number of new nations, the smaller the size of each, the better, for it will be much more difficult to sow the illusion of self-sufficiency if slogans were by North Dakota or by 56th Street, that now it has convinced the public to buy American. Similarly, down with South Dakota or in a fanon, down with 55th Street, will be a more difficult sell than spreading fear and hatred of the Japanese. Similarly, the absurdities and unfortunate consequences of fiat paper money will be far more evident if each province or each neighborhood or each street block were allowed to print its own currency. A more decentralized world will likely be far more sound to such market commodities, such as gold and silver, for its money. Part 4. The Pure Anarcho-Capitalist Model 
I raised the pure anarcho-capitalist model in this paper, not so much to advocate for the model per se as to propose it as a guide for settling vexed current disputes about nationality. The pure model, simply, is that no land areas, square f footage in the world, shall remain public. Every square foot of land area, be they the streets, squares, or neighborhoods, is privatized. Total, privata total privatization would help solve nationality problems, often in surprising ways, and I suggest that existing states or classical liberal states try to approach such a system even while some land areas remain in the governmental sphere. Open borders, or the camp of the saints problem. The question of open borders or free immigration has become an accelerating problem for classical liberals. This is first because the welfare state increasingly subsidizes immigrants to enter and receive permanent assistance, and second because cultural boundaries have become increasingly swamped. I began to rethink my views on immigration when, as the Soviet Union collapsed, it became clear that ethnic Russians had been encouraged to flood into Estonia and Latvia in order to destroy the culture and languages of these people. Previously, it was easy to dismiss as unrealistic as John Rapol's anti-immigration novel, The Camp of the Saints, in which virtually the entire population of India decides to move in small boats into France, and the French, infected by liberal ideology cannot summon the will to prevent economic and cultural national destruction. As cultural and welfare state problems have been intensified, it, it became impossible to dismiss Rapol's concerns any longer. However, on rethinking immigration on the basis of the pure anarcho-capitalist model, it became clear to me that a totally privatized country would not have open borders at all. If every piece of land in a country were owned by some person, group, or corporation, this would mean that no immigrant could enter there unless invited to enter and allowed to rent or purchase property. A totally privatized society will be as close as the particular inhabitants and property owners desire. It seems clear then that the regime of open borders that exists de facto in the US really amounts to a compulsory opening by the centralized state. The state in charge of all streets and public land areas and does not genuinely reflect the wishes of the proprietors. Under total privatization, many local conflicts and externality problems, not merely Im the immigration problem, will be neatly settled. With every locale and neighborhood owned by private firms, corporations, or contractual communities, true diversity would reign in accordance with the preferences of each community. Some neighborhoods would be ethnically or economically diverse, while others would be e e ethnically or economically homogenous. Some localities would permit pornography or prostitution or drugs or abortion, or others would prohibit any and all of them. The prohibitions would not be state imposed, but would simply be requirements for the resident or use of some person's or community's land area. While stated to have the itch to impose their values on everyone else would be disappointed, every group or interest would at least have the satisfaction of living in neighborhoods of people who share its values and preferences. While neighborhood ownership would not provide utopia or a pencil for all conflict, it would at least provide a second best solution that most people would be willing to live with. Enclaves and Exclaves One obvious problem with the secession of nationalities from centralized states concerns mixed areas, or enclaves and exclaves. Decomposing the swollen central nation-state of Yugoslavia into constituent parts has solved many conflicts by providing independent nationhood for Slovenes, Serbs, and Croats. But what about Bosnia, where many towns and villages are mixed? One solution is to encourage more of the same, through still more decentralization. For it, for example, Eastern Sarajevo is Serb and Western Sarajevo is Muslim. Then they become parts of the respective separate nations. But this, of course, would result in a large amount of enclaves, parts of nations surrounded by other nations. How can this be solved? In the first place, the enclave and exclave problem exists right now. One of the most vicious existing conflicts, in which the, the US has not meddled yet because it has not been shown on C CNN, is the problem of necro Karabakh, an Armenian exclave totally surrounded by, and therefore formally within, Azerbaijan. necro -Karabakh, Karabakh should clearly be part of Armenia, but how then? Will Armenians of Karabakh avoid the present fate of blockade by Azers, and how will they avoid mil military battles in trying to keep 
open a land border to a land border corridor to Armenia. Under total privatization, of course, these problems disappear. Nowadays, no one in the U.S. buys land without making sure that his title to the land is clear. In the same way, in a fully privatized world, excess rights would be obviously a more crucial part of land ownership. In such a world, then Karabakh property owners will make sure that they have purchased access through the rights through an Azar land corridor. Decentralization also provides a workable solution for the seemingly in insolvable permanent conflict in Northern Ireland. When the British patrolled Partition Ireland, sorry, not patrol. Partition Ireland in the early 1920s. They agreed to perform I mean, a second, a more micromanaged partition. They never carried out through through on this promise. If the British would permit a detailed, parsh by parsh partition vote in Northern Ireland, however, most of the land area, which is majority Catholic, would probably hive off and join the Republic. Such counties such as Tyrone and, and Fermanagh, Southern da Down, and Southern Armagh, for example, the Protestants would be left with Belfast, County Antrim, and other areas north of Belfast. The remaining problem would be the Catholic enclave within the city of Belfast. But again, an approach to the anarcho-capitalist model could be attained by permitting the purchase of access rights to the enclave. Pending total privatization, it is clear that our model could be approached and conflicts minimized by permitting secessions and local control down to the micro neighborhood level and by developing contractual access rights for enclaves and exclaves. In the US, it becomes important in moving toward such radical decentralization for libertarians and classical liberals, indeed, for many minority or dissident groups to begin to lay the greatest stress on the forgotten 10th Amendment and to try to decompose the role and power of the centralizing Supreme Court. Rather than trying to get people of one's own ideological persuasion of the Supreme Court, its power should be rolled back and minimized as far as possible, and its power decomposed into state or even local judicial bodies. Citizenship and Voting Rights One vesting current problem centers on who becomes a citizen of a given country. Since citizenship confers voting rights, the Anglo-American model, in which every baby born in the country's land area automatically becomes a citizen, clearly invites welfare immigration by expectant par parents. In the U.S., for example, a current problem is illegal immigrants whose babies, if born on American soil, automatically become citizens and therefore entitle themselves and their parents to permanent welfare payments and free medical care. Clearly, the French system, in which one has, has to be born a citizen to become an automatic citizen, is far closer to the idea of nation by consent. It is also important to, re to rethink the entire concept and function of voting. Should anyone have a quote-unquote right to vote? Ross Wilder Lane, the mid-20th cent mid century U.S. libertarian theorist, was, one asked, was once asked if she believed in women's suffrage. No, she replied. I'm against male suffrage as well. The Latvians and Estonians have... Cognitively ta tackled the problem of Russian immigrants by allowing them to continue permanent, permanently as residents, but not granting them citizenship or therefore the right to vote. The Swiss welcomed temporary guest workers, but severely discouraged permanent immigration and effectoral citizenship and voting. Let us turn for enlightenment once again to the anarcho capitalist model. What would voting be like in a totally privatized society? Not only would voting be diverse, but more importantly, who would really care? Probably the most deeply satisfying form of voting to an economist is the corporation, or the joint stock company, in which voting is proportionate to one share of ownership of the firm's assets. But also there is, and would be, a myriad of private clubs of all sorts. It is usually assumed that club decisions are made on the basis of one vote per member. But this is generally untrue. Undoubtedly, the most be the best run and most cl pleasant cl clubs are the ones run by a small self perverting oligarchy of the ablest and most interested. A system most ple pleasant for the rank and file non-voting member as well as for the elite. If I am a rank and file member of, say, a chess club, why should I worry about voting if I am satisfied with the way the club is run? And if I am interested in running things, I will probably be asked to join the ruling elite by the grateful oligarchy, always on the lookout for 
energetic members. And finally, if I'm happy with about the way the club is run, I can readily quit and join another club or even form one of my own. That, of course, is one of the great virtues of a free and privatized society, whether we are considering a chess club or a contractual neighborhood community. Clearly, as we begin to work towards the pure model, as more and more areas of life become either privatized or micro-decentralized, the less important voting becomes. Of course, we are a long way from this goal, but it is important to remember to begin and particularly to change our political culture, which treats democracy or the right to vote as a supreme political good. In fact, the voting press should be considered trivial and unimportant at best and never a right apart from possible mechanisms stemming from conceptual contract. In the modern world, democracy or voting is only important either to join or ratify the use of the government to control others, or to use it as a way of preventing oneself or one's group from being controlled. Voting, however, is at best an inefficient instrument for self-defense, and it's far better to replace it by breaking up central government power altogether. In sum, if we proceed with the decomposition and decentralization of the modern centralizing and coercive nation-state, deconstructing the, nation, the state into constituent nationalities and neighborhoods, we shall at one and at the same time reduce the scope of government power, the scope and importance of voting, and the extent of social conflict. The scope of private contract and of voluntary consent will be enhanced, and the brutal rep repressive state will, grad will be gradually dissolved into harmonious and increased prosper and increased prosperous social order